These days, more people than ever are suffering, whether it's through the grieving process of losing loved ones or through your own physical and mental pain. The good news is there are powerful techniques that have helped tens of millions, including myself. These techniques don't require a leap of faith. You're able to confirm how powerful they are through direct experience. Join me as we explore the depths of our consciousness, as well as our relationship with death. Really quickly, I wanted to thank you guys for the kind responses from my first video. Um, I've been loving the uh, messages I've been getting from all you guys. It's really helped a lot of you guys. And uh, this video is even more important. This is gonna be the most important video I ever make. And that's because it's all about, it's all about reducing the suffering in this world. And it's helped me tremendously. It's helped so many others. I decided to make this video because it will be so beneficial to so many of you out there. I've overcome an insane number of things in life and somehow I was able to even graduate college while doing so. I've only been able to do so through the methods I'm about to show you. But first, you need to understand our relationship with death. Just because you were born into a culture, does that make that culture automatically correct? Are they automatically all-knowing? Of course not. So there is much value to be had by understanding other cultures' views on death as well. The way humans view death depends on the culture you were raised in. Of course, people will always have the pain of being separated from their loved ones when they die, but there are many cultures that actually celebrate death. The Mayans actually played a game sort of like a hybrid between basketball and soccer, with the first person to get the ball through the vertical hoop you see high up uh, on the wall in this image won the opportunity to be sacrificed for the gods. I took all these photos years ago from Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. Here's one that is disturbing. This is one of the two cenotes on site where they would sacrifice young virgins to the gods in hopes of the gods delivering rain. It's ironic that the Mayan civilization died out from a massive drought. Their water reserves went dry Maybe that's a sign you shouldn't be sacrificing young girls. Death does not concern us, because as long as we exist, death is not here. And when it does come, we no longer exist. Epicurus. I agree with most of that quote, but based on near-death experiences, so many people actually hover outside of their bodies. They have no brain activity, no heart activity, many for over 20 minutes, and they're still more conscious than ever, and able to see more than they've ever been able to see so even if we are living in a simulation I feel that there is something real in us that will carry on our spirit your soul whatever you want to call it my favorite all-time Alan Watts lecture is called a happy death he pointed out how Western culture tries to deny that death is coming even with late-stage cancer patients people say you'll be all right why not say what Ellen Watts said? Here's a part of that lecture. So we don't know what to do with a dying person. We don't get around that person and say, listen, now listen, man, listen, I got the news for you. You're gonna die and this is gonna be great. Look, no more responsibilities. Don't have to pay those bills anymore. <laughs> don't have to worry about anything. You're going to just die. And let's go out with a bang. Let's have a party. He even half joked about creating the institution for creative dying. I would support that 100%. That way the person who is dying isn't just lied to and surrounded by misery until the time comes to pass on. The dying person could decide to throw an end of life party if they felt up to it. Family and friends could talk about the good times and celebrate a life well lived. And near the beginning of that lecture, here is one of my favorite parts. There's a dinner party happening and they were talking about death. Sir Roderick, you haven't said a word. What do you think is gonna to happen to you when you die? Oh, he said, <laughs> I'm perfectly certain I shall go to heaven and enjoy everlasting bliss, but I wish you wouldn't indulge in such a depressing conversation. <laughs> uh, it gets me every time. Don't you see what that reveals? That no matter what we tell ourselves, we are a bunch of confused humans who are trying to figure out this reality that we find ourselves in. 
If you saw my last video, you will know that we know less than 5% of reality based on what science can currently detect. So for my wake and funeral, when the time comes, hopefully not too soon, I feel death is as natural as birth. So I want it to be a celebration. I want purple, black, and green decorations and flowers. Heck, even some balloons, make it fun. I want a beer keg filled with Beck's beer and an open bar. I want as much laughter and fun as possible. Cremate me, no exposed corpse misery necessary. Also, I've always hated neckties. It always feels like a noose is around my neck and I have to because society says it's required. So, no ties, they are pathetic. Death is the wish of some, the relief of many, and the end of all. It sets the slave at liberty, carries the banished man home, and places all mortals on the same level, insomuch that life itself were a punishment without it. Seneca. And I promised you guys a Seneca video. I changed my mind because of all the messages that I got from you guys. And uh, I thought this one was going to be far more beneficial, but he's a Stoic philosopher from about 2,000 years ago. And think about what that quote actually means. Think about the people who are going to try to cling to life as much as possible. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, these filthy rich people. I'm not calling them filthy, just filthy rich. These people have everything going for them. They have the best of all medical uh, treatments. They can do whatever they want. And who are the people who are going to welcome death? That's the people in the alleys, the homeless people, the mentally ill, the diseased. You know, these people are suffering. It, it's horrific. And uh, I think we got to do more to help these people. Do you think Brad Pitt needs another woman throwing herself at him? Of course not. These people in the, the gutters, we need to express love for them and we need to go out of our way to help them and talk to them more and, and really do everything we can for them. Seneca was not prepared for his much younger friend's death. Because he was so much younger, Seneca never considered the possibility of him dying first. When his death happened, the suffering was far worse for him. If that can happen to one of the greatest philosophers of all time, it can happen to anyone. It is important to contemplate losing anyone you know. Well, it may cause some short-term suffering in doing so. The longer-term reduction of suffering is far worth it. This is our big mistake, to think we look forward to death. Most of death is already gone. Whatever time has passed is owned by death. Seneca. What Seneca meant by this is, well, think about it. Where's the baby you? The toddler you, the child you, the teenager you. Whatever phase you're in, the past is gone. That's pretty much death. It's already been happening to us the whole time. And speaking of that, Seneca also talked about how there's no such thing as a long life. Whether you live to your 20 or you live till you're 110, that's a blink in time. <laughs> You have to check out my previous video. Humanity's barely been in this universe. Everything in history that you have ever heard of has been in a blink of time. Humanity's brand new. When great loss happens, deaths close to you or your own approaching death, this is an opportunity for stepping completely out of identification with form and realizing the essence of who you are or that the essence of anyone who is suffering or dying is beyond death, Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle is a philosopher and he's had the greatest impact on my life by far. And that's why this video is gonna be so heavy on him. He's still alive. He's, him and Elon Musk, in my opinion, are the two most important human beings on this planet. The mental suffering you create is always some form of non-acceptance some form of unconscious resistance to what is. On the level of thought, the resistance is some form of judgment. The intensity of the suffering depends on the degree of resistance to the present moment, Eckhart Tolle. 
I've come to learn there is tremendous power in, in accepting whatever your current life situation is. For me, you know, with the chronic pain stuff, the ankylosing spondylitis, it, I resisted it so hard in my early 20s and it made things so much worse. And it's like whenever you say something shouldn't be or should be, you're going to cause more suffering. Think about a dying dog or any other animal. They don't have this added layer of emotional and mental suffering. They die with grace. They have the suffering in the moment and they're not pondering what happens in the afterlife or what's gonna happen to him or her or this family member or this friend without them. Or, you know, these dogs and animals, they die with grace. And through practice in what I'm about to show you in this section of the video, you can actually learn how to train your mind to be just as in the now and in the moment as naturally uh, as animals or as young children. They're in the now and in the moment before the indoctrination in school systems and just societal pressures happen. That's coming up later in the video. During live speeches, Eckhart has said, when you bring your consciousness back to the now, you realize you aren't in hell, you're in a warm bed. And that refers to quieting the mind and it's mostly false projections of suffering into the distant future. The ego says, I shouldn't have to suffer. And that makes you suffer so much more. It is a distortion of the truth, which is always paradoxical. The truth is that you need to say yes to suffering before you can transcend it. Eckhart Tolle. If you saw my previous video, you know I have ankylosing spondylitis. It is basically the immune system being confused and attacking your spine, especially your lower back. The late stages of this disease are totally messed up, but my condition is more mild than most cases. Imagine being in your early 20s and thinking that you're on the path towards living a meaningless, painful, poverty-filled life. I projected into the future based on the horrible images of the late stages of this disease. I imagined becoming a deformed cripple in extreme pain, followed by death. For many reasons, I now doubt that's my future, but I didn't know back then, so you see why I needed help. I had not yet learned about not believing every thought of the future. I hadn't yet discovered the teachings of the East and Stoicism. Those were some of the hardest years of my life by far. I wish I had my future self to talk to back then, but at least I'm able to tell you guys these truths now. All negativity is caused by an accumulation of psychological time and denial of the present. Unease, anxiety, tension, stress, worry, all forms of fear are caused by too much future and not enough presence. Guilt, regret, resentment, grievances, sadness, Bitterness and all forms of non-forgiveness are caused by too much past and not enough presence, Eckhart told. I recently learned about the soldiers in World War II as they realized they didn't have much of a future left. They experienced everything in the now as more valuable to them. Food and water tasted better. Laughter felt more precious. This was because something was happening in their own consciousness, the external danger influenced a change in them. That same internal emotional shift, it's possible for you to access it at any time. All you have to do is learn how to access it. The whole essence of Zen consists in walking along the razor's edge of now, to be so utterly, so completely present that no problem, no suffering, nothing that is not who you are in your essence can survive in you. In the now, in the abundance of time, all your problems dissolve. Suffering needs time. It cannot survive in the now, Eckhart Tolle. He who lives in harmony with himself, lives in harmony with the universe. Marcus Aurelius. I was in two rush hours a day in Los Angeles. And for most people, that is a high stress situation. On every highway, during every rush hour, there is usually an accident and a traffic jam. It's a miracle if there isn't one. Add on top of that being in physical pain, it could have been real stressful. But after reading Eckhart Tolle so much and listening to him on my car speakers and on audio form, I experienced this mental shift and I was able to find total peace in the traffic. In this state of being, it's so easy to become one 
with the beauty around you. I found it even in the taillights of cars, sunsets, mountains, and the glowing signs of businesses. Now I'm able to go into this state of becoming one with the now at will. It's nice to know that nobody can ever take this state of being from you. Once you learn how to access it, that is. Accepting means you allow yourself to feel whatever it is that you're feeling at that moment. It is a part of the isness of the now. You can't argue with what is. Well, you can, but if you do, you suffer. Eckhart Tolle. No matter what you're going through, the most important thing you have to realize is that you have a great degree of control over the level of emotional suffering you have. Even while dealing with physical pain or other health problems, these are two separate battlefronts, and most doctors won't even tell you this. What helped me most was changing my relationship with the present moment. At first, in my early 20s, it was through meditating for hours a day. As I learned from various books when I first started this uh, truth-seeking journey. But at around age 26, I learned how to create that peaceful meditative state, the state of being one with the now. You can return at will during any life situation. You don't have to sit with your eyes closed to have this experience of oneness and peace. It can happen any time you will it, that is, after you've learned how to attain it. Not to be able to stop thinking is a dreadful affliction, but we don't realize this because almost everyone is suffering from it, so it's considered normal. This incessant mental noise prevents you from finding the realm of inner stillness that is inseparable from being. Eckhart Tolle. Learning how to obtain this peaceful state of being in the now and remaining there isn't a fast and easy process for most people. From a very young age, our school systems have conditioned us to live in fear and anxiety of the future. As Cat Stevens sang, from the moment I could talk, I was ordered to listen. Our school systems don't teach mindfulness to counteract the constant programming that is meant to create cogs in the corporate machine. They want another cog worker, no matter what the emotional cost is. So this lifetime of conditioning is going to take some time to overcome. The National Science Foundation says an average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Of those, 80% are negative and 95% are repetitive thoughts. Think about how many nagging and useless thoughts are happening to you all the time. The key is to treat them like an annoying child who won't shut the hell up. Tune them out and focus on the now. Eckhart had his awakening when he said, I can't live with myself anymore. And he realized that there were two entities in that sentence, the myself and the I. He knew that couldn't be true. And in that moment, he realized he was the consciousness and the observer of the mental noise. Your automatic thinking that happens to you on a daily basis is not who you are. Realize that even if you tell yourself you're not going to have any thoughts whatsoever for two minutes. Pause this video if you have to. Those thoughts are going to come. You're going to think about your kid. Oh, is he coming home from school? What's that sound outside? Oh, it's somebody knocking at the door. Whatever it is. Or you're going to think, hey, look at this crazy guy on YouTube spewing his nonsense. <laughs> Whatever it is. I don't care. But you're going to have those thoughts. So, yeah, they happen to you just like the breeze, just like uh, the temperature outside happens to you. It's very strange when you really come to this realization. First off, realize that spontaneous and repetitive thinking is usually harmful. Eckhart is the very rare type who had this transformation in an instant. In one early speech, he said that the negative thoughts don't even try anymore. For myself and most others, it's a very slow evolving process. I forget where I heard this first, but basically this long evolving process could be compared to a dirty cup of water. You keep having more purified water droplets entering into the cup every day, you know, as some of it keeps evaporating out. Eventually, over time, the whole cup is going to become pure. It's going to become clear, good water. And that's basically what's going to happen with your mind. The more you dive into this kind of content, especially Eckhart and uh, Alan Watts is tremendous as well, but Eckhart breaks it down in a more simple, basic English form that's more accessible to just about anybody. 
the best way to enter into the now is to enter through what Eckhart calls are the portals into the now. And that is basically your sense perceptions. Uh, my favorite one is to focus on breathing because that's always there. And when you focus on it, you can't help but be tied down to the now. But your sense of touch, your vision is a very powerful one where you could just stare at uh, certain patterns in front of you, whatever it may be. Uh, auditory helps a lot too, especially if there's a like an ocean near you where you're able to listen to the waves crashing in or even your sense of taste but that's always short-lived as you eat you know so just about anything that you could imagine but you have to make the conscious decision of focusing on it and trying to not even acknowledge the bullcrap thoughts that pop up in your head which society says is normal which it truly isn't normal <laughs> When you realize you are suffering more emotionally or mentally, it's usually because you've become absorbed into whatever negative thought or situation has arisen. For me, entering the now is sort of like what I would imagine walking a tightrope would be, where you have to have complete focus, and I fall off this tightrope many times a day, but Eckhart is the first to acknowledge that even if you have five minutes of consciousness in the now, in the present moment, even if you have five minutes of it a day, that's still of tremendous value. And so when your suffering level goes up, whether you're thinking about your breakup with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or thinking about your future of maybe being alone, or any negative garbage situation that life throws at you, you have to remember, get back to the portals, into the now. <laughs> it's, it sounds so easy and basic, but our school systems don't even teach this. It's, it's so pathetic. It's, and then once you start doing this, you start having tremendous insights. And for me, I've been having uh, an incredible amount of uh, creative energy coming through. Seneca actually wanted a life of trouble because that is the only kind of life that can truly test your character. He said that life of luxury weakens you. And there's 100% truth to that. Like if you look at the, I, I love history. So if you look at the Mongol empire, they realized that the hard uh, conditions on the steppe and the freezing cold and the high winds and the constantly having to migrate and it made men stronger. The Probably the strongest ancient army of all time, in my opinion, is Alexander the Great and his Macedonian or Macedonian, de depending on which pronunciation you go with, his army. Uh, these guys were mountain men. They were, you know, far north of Greece and they were the strongest warriors in the world. And so the Mongols, they would actually send their, their rich youth out to go live on the steppe again in order to strengthen them, in order to ensure they had strong warriors for future wars. So it's pretty much widely acknowledged that luxury weakens you and hardships, life of trouble, as Seneca just said in that quote, that is what makes you strong. And for those of you who are dealing with chronic illness, whether it's emotional or physical, I heard some great advice that I try to live by. And this applies to anyone dealing with any chronic health issue. Jordan Peterson told his daughter Michaela some great advice. She had horrible symptoms from multiple chronic medical conditions, including a form of arthritis. I may paraphrase a bit, but here's the sum of it. Life is going to suck either way, but it is going to suck even worse if you use your medical condition as an excuse not to try. I've been through phases of not trying and even making this video is hard, but anything worth doing is hard. Let those words inspire all you sufferers out there. Take care of yourself today and tomorrow will take care of itself. Whether you're having mental or physical symptoms, seize the day, the time is short. Just keep in mind, the more we value things outside our control, the less control we have. Epictetus. If you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to revoke at any moment. Marcus Aurelius. True freedom is living as if you had completely chosen whatever you feel or experience in this moment. This inner alignment with the now is the end of suffering. 
Eckhart Tolle. I really hope this video helps you guys. When people are really stressed out, that is when they tend to make bad decisions. I've lost so many friends to drug overdoses, whether it's taking hard drugs, joining a gang, bullying, or whatever else. Directing your consciousness to the present moment allows you to have a greater degree of control over your emotions. Desperation makes people do crazy things. I know firsthand, but I've been lucky enough to get away with my bad decisions. I'm just as flawed as anybody else. So please, if you know anybody who is suffering, share this video with them. Get them on that Eckhart path. In my opinion, his book, A New Earth, is his best. So get that one first. It covers the same thing as his more famous uh, Power of Now book, but written in a much better way. Also, the more you listen to his audio, the more it deprograms you for the better. You can regain that childhood enthusiasm for the little things in life. It's just a matter of putting in the time. Thanks for watching, guys. And I end like normal. Momentum Mori. Remember, you shall die. How appropriate for this video. But uh, yeah, hit the like button and uh, subscribe and hit me up on social media. I want to hear if this video helps you guys. And uh, I really hope it does. And that's the reason I decided to make this one instead of the Seneca one. Uh, hopefully I get that Seneca one done pretty soon. Much love to you guys. Memento Mori. Peace out till next time. Also, be sure to check out my other epic visual video on the nature of reality. It's even more beautiful than this video.